Kenya's second largest bank by assets, Equity Group has posted some rather impressive financial results of the first half of the year. The bank's six-month pre-tax profits nearly doubled to $217 million from the 109.6 reported in the first half of 2020. Now, sharp growth in Equity Group's interest income and their non-interest income led to the high profits that we're seeing here at the end of the six-month window. Total interest income, that's the bank's main source of revenue, was up to $390 million in the first in the half year rather that ended in June. That's 30% more compared to the same period a year ago. It's non-interest income from fees and commissions on loans, foreign exchange, uh, trading income, dividend income and so on. That went up by 44% to $190 million uh, compared to the same period in 2020. The bank's total operating expenses only went up by 3.8% to the end of the half year ending in June. All right, then, clearly the market absolutely loved the results that they saw today. But where does this leave the bank moving into the second half of the year? Let's explore that. Rana Gardia handles bank coverage across sub-Saharan Africa at EFG Hermes. He joins us now live um, on the program from London. Um, Rana, good to see you on the program. So what were your initial impressions of the numbers that James Mwangi and his team presented today? Uh, good evening, Rama. Thanks for having me. Uh, yes, uh, you know, at, at, uh, looking at the numbers today, at uh, first glance, they seem pretty impressive. Uh, as you mentioned, you know, on a year-on-year -year basis, earnings almost uh, doubled. Uh, you know, that's partly driven by the low base effect, because as you remember, the second quarter of last year was pretty poor because the bank accrued some pretty substantial loan loss provisions uh, at the uh, on the outbreak of COVID. Uh, earnings was also boosted by in inorganically because of the acquisition the, uh, the bank made in, in DRC. Uh, having said that, even if you exclude those factors, you know, on a pre-provisioning basis, the, uh, the bank's profit before tax increased by almost 34%, which is quite impressive given the operating environment uh, that them and every other, uh, you know, East African banks are, are operating under. And it, so the bank also did manage to trim its, its NPL ratio. It's down to, well, just under 11%. The industry average is closer uh, to 14% looking at the, the central bank data that we have by the end of June. That's lower than industry average, but should we expect that number to be sticky? Uh, you're right. Um, the NPL ratio did decline on a quarter on quarter basis to 10.7%. And I think from an investor's perspective, that was important because it had consistently been increasing for the past uh, three or four quarters prior to that. Uh, looking forward, if you look at the guidance that management provided today, they're expecting the NPL ratio to uh, decline to around 7 to 10% by the end of the year. Um, so, you know, they're expecting the NPL ratio to, to continue to improve. Will it continue to improve? Um, I think there might be some challenges. Uh, first and foremost, as you know, you know the COVID uh, crisis is far from over. Uh, regionally, you know, many, many economies across the region continue to contain the pandemic by imposing intermittent uh, lockdowns. Uh, these lockdowns are bound to have a negative impact on growth uh, GDP. Uh, and, and then on, on top of that, in, in, uh, for, for Kenya in particular, we're also about to enter an, an election cycle. And historically, as you may know, you know, that has resulted in delayed government payments, which results in a slowdown in, in the economy. So the macro environment remains challenging. And I think as a result of that, the bank's asset quality and, and generally the sector's asset quality will continue to remain under pressure for the next 12, 18 months. Uh, in our estimates, we continue to estimate an NPL ratio of around 10 percent and cost of risk of around two and a half percent for 2021 which is at the upper end of uh, management guidance. Okay, so the bank CEO, um, James Mungu, is speaking about uh, the DRC and, and Tanzania, but a lot more bullish than the DRC, describing it as a, as a key driver of future growth of the business. And yes, the DRC has impressive numbers in some respects, population size, mineral deposits, and so on and so forth, but it also has many problems on the other end uh, to balance that off as well. Do you, do you agree with that statement, uh, given the fact that the bulk of their business is still you know, really based in Kenya? Uh, yeah, I agree. Uh, you know, in, I, like, I, I partially agree on that. You know, of the two countries that he, he identified as that will determine, that will be the key growth drivers for the, for the group, DRC and Tanzania. DRC, I think, um, uh, makes a lot of sense. DRC over the last uh, four or five years, uh, especially last year has become, especially after the acquisition last year, has become a big part of the overall group. It now contributes around 30% of overall group uh, assets. Um, so, so the, the the growth of DRC will will go to, uh, to a large extent in terms of determining the overall growth growth for for, for the group. Uh, in terms of the opportunities, 
uh, if you look at DRC over the last four or five years, from a liabilities perspective, you know, it has grown quite substantially, especially after they changed the mining laws, I think, in 2016, 2017. So from a liabilities perspective, the growth has been very, very strong and continues to remain strong. We haven't seen that translate into strong asset growth. Uh, but again, speaking to management uh, you know, earlier this year, it seemed uh, quite bullish uh, that that growth on the asset side will start to come through as they continue to roll out the, the model, which has been very successful in Kenya and, and in some of the other countries as they continue to roll out that model into DRC. This, um, speaking of the model, though, because I, I'm going to start thinking of equity now as essentially as a sort of um, a tech company in some respects, because they're trying to essentially make themselves able to reach as many people as possible with the lowest possible physical footprint. But does is, is that the right way to think about equity, is especially as it expands across Eastern Africa? Is that model as scalable as we think it is, or might it run into problems in the DRC in Tanzania? Because in terms of tax adoption, Kenya tends to be a bit of an outlier. Uh, I agree. Uh, Kenya is a bit of an outlier, and that's largely because of the success of you know uh, the, 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 the dominant uh, telco company. Uh, outside of Kenya, um, I, I, look, I, I think the initially the growth driver is not going to be from the tech perspective. Uh, what what they're really trying to uh, implement is the agency banking model, which was also quite successful in Kenya if you go back to around 2012, 2013. So I think in, in the short term, what you're going to see is uh, the, gro the, growth drive, the growth engine of, of the group uh, in DRC, in Tanzania, also in Uganda and, and, and Rwanda as well, will be the traditional uh, analog model, uh, as per se. You know, they, they will have to co continue uh, to expand their, their branch network and then complement that with an agency network. And then as smartphone penetration continues to increase, as the level of sophistication uh, of, of bank customers in those countries continues to increase, then, you know, the tech, tech ad adoption will come like we've seen in, in Kenya. Okay, so one last question for you, Ronak. Um, 2020 obviously was a pretty grim year, um, and that makes, as you pointed out earlier, it makes 2021 numbers look pretty rosy in comparison. Um, are you going to be sticking to your current price target on the bank, or will that require a bit of revision? Um, well, firstly, I must point out that I'm not as bullish as uh, management. Uh, if you look at their guidance uh, this year, they're guiding towards an ROE of around 25 to 30%. My ROE guidance, which I'm still sticking to despite the numbers this morning, is around 22%. And that's because, as I mentioned earlier, I'm a bit conservative because of the continued impact of COVID, the elections in, in uh, Kenya. Uh, having said that, you know, an ROE of 22% in the current environment, I think, is quite impressive. Also within that, we are seeing a clear direction of how the ROE goes from around the 20-22% range right now to around the 25% plus range in the next uh, two to three years, especially as DRC. Uh, the profitability of DRC continues to improve. So, you know, on that basis, given that the ROE, uh, ROE continues to improve, uh, even after the uh, bullish uh, run that the stock has had over the last three, four months, uh, it's still trading at a relatively inexpensive price to book of around 1.2 times. Historically, if you go back to 2016 pre-rate caps, when the bank was achieving similar ROEs of 25, 30%, it used to trade at a price to book of around two to two and a half times. So on that basis, still continues to look uh, quite quite cheap. All right, we'll leave it there for the time being. Uh, Ronak Gardhi, good to have you in the program as always. Much appreciated. Ronak Gardhi there from uh, EFG Hermes joining us from London.